Honorable Minister for Commerce, Industry and Textiles, Mr. Anish Sharma Ji, Dr. Sam Pedroda, Chairman National Innovation Council, Mr. Peter Barker, President World Business Council for Sustainable Development, Dr. R.K. Pachauri, Director General Terry, and President Terry Business Council for Sustainable Development, uh, Ms. Annapurna Vancheshwaran, Director of Sustainable Development Outreach, Galaxy of CEOs and corporate honchos from India and abroad, distinguished participants, guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon. I am not deliberately using warm because warm has got some serious connotations when we talk about climate changes. Uh, it is my privilege to be amongst such enlightened and awakened lot here who are concerned about sustainable development and I must compliment Terry for such timely initiative of holding this World CEO Sustainability Summit because it is an agenda. Today, no business can think of doing business without factoring sustainability in, into this. And this agenda has to be not only top driven, but also has to be wholeheartedly accepted and implemented by the grassroots. So I'm really glad to be addressing all these concerned CEOs here who are committed to sustainability development. As most of you may be knowing, I am tagged to the hydrocarbon sector that is notorious, at least in the public mind space, as being a prolific polluter directly and indirectly. Directly, the oil spills have done little to revise public perception, and indirectly, our products are considered instrumental in abetting pollution. In fact, Mr. Bakar was telling me just before coming here that it is the exploration and refinery which only pollutes 20 percent. It is the transportation sector or the products which do the balance to 80 percent of, of the crime. I do not offer any apologies for doing what we do. It is our business. We are in the business of exploring and exploiting hydrocarbons. It is what we know the best and surely we are good at it. The moot issue, however, is how can we conduct this business while protecting the global commons, which is also the theme of this summit. Allow me to dwell upon this train of thought further as I present to you a five-point agenda for affirmative action in the context of my industry vertical. This house has substantial intellectual capital and with learned speakers to follow, surely more elaborate containment and mitigation strategies will emerge. First, the business, that is our business of hydrocarbons, of fellow professional Graham Steen is credited with this quote on energy forecasting, and I quote, energy forecasting is easy, it's getting it right that is difficult, unquote. Notwithstanding the pun intended in the quote, Virtually all energy forecasting studies indicate that fossil fuels that include hydrocarbons will continue to dominate the global energy basket well into the foreseeable future. We simply do not have alternatives that could fuel the surging global economic growth that is estimated to triple the energy demand by 2050 from 2000 levels. So fossil fuels are here to stay. What then is the next best option? What then is the next best, best option? Many fellow professionals lay great store in emergence of natural gas as a significant component of global energy basket and promote it actively on account of its low carbon footprint. The shale gas revolution in the United States is most encouraging and has emerged as game changer. Discovering new waterless fracking techniques would make it even, even more attractive and expand the envelope significantly. However, it too does have serious issues regarding its carbon footprint, and we'll have to address this as we go along. In promoting natural gas as the fuel of choice, I see great potential for reducing carbon dioxide emissions, especially in terms of its potential to replace coal. Gas availability is expected to be plentiful, especially from unconventional sources that include tight gas, shale gas, and coal bed methane. IEA estimates a potential recovery of around 13,400 trillion cubic feet from unconventional gas sources. A caveat, however, is in terms of infrastructure, particularly in the transportation sector, to use this fuel efficiently. The switch from oil to gases fuel will need establishment of an entire ecosystem for which investment must begin immediately. In addition to our conventional business, our investment into new and renewable energy space is also substantial. We invest in thin film solar cells, wind power, hydrogen, geothermal energy, fuel cells, and bio-waste energy as a natural extension of our energy business. 
We also fund research into these areas and are sanguine that these investments will give us payouts in the future. Second, how do we conduct our existing business responsibly to ensure that our operational strategies include curative and containment measures to mitigate impact on the environment? Let me assure this House that environmental stewardship is our foremost priority. Beyond lift service, most of us in the industry have adopted clearly articulated corporate frameworks on climate change and sustainable development, including targeted policies such, such as the ones on sustainable water management and green buildings from which focused implementable strategies will emerge. We have instituted GHG accounting programs to identify potential mitigation opportunities and subsequently take remedial measures. In fact, the more progressive ones amongst, the, amongst us, including ONGC, the company I am privileged to head, have even started their, have stated their intent to become carbon neutral, though no fixed time frame has yet been committed as it impinges upon national policy and implementation frameworks and conventions. Globally, carbon capture and sequestering has gained traction in the hydrocarbon sector and will surely be adopted universally as technology developments make them more cost effective. Further, we have not restricted such measures to within our corporate boundaries but have extended them to our business partners as well. We have adopted policies on greening the vendor chain and have even embedded green and sustainable development models into our corporate social responsibility initiatives. You will observe that all these measures are voluntary and constitute affirmative actions beyond statutory obligations those and those stipulated by law of the land. Third is our initiative towards outreach and advocacy of environmental responsibility and sustainable development practices. The energy sector of which the hydrocarbon space is a subset has embraced this cause wholeheartedly as is, and is in the forefront in lending support to all platforms that discuss and debate this issue. All our conferences and seminars invariably have a dedicated segment on environmental stewardship and development of new and renewable energy. We embrace and actively support demand-side management as well, however paradoxical it may sound, and that includes fuel conservation, energy efficiency, and switch to cleaner forms of fuels such as natural gas. As an example, I can cite the close connect between Terry and ONGC that have worked together for years on collaborative oil sector related projects as well as on outreach and advocacy campaigns that include this summit as well. ONGC and few other hydrocarbon sector companies globally are also members of United Nations Global Compact Initiatives and support its 10 principles that include issues of environmental protection and sustainable development. Such supports cannot be taken lightly as it constitutes a voluntary commitment that is driven by the heart, by the heart and not by the head. Fourth is our role as global citizen. I speak of contribution of the individuals in the organization. The disconnect between what we publicly espouse and privately implement as individuals is profound. To bridge this gap, I propose the R6 mantra as an extension to the present R3 version that most of us are familiar which is reduce, recycle, and re reuse. I would like to propose three more R's, recover, replace, and refuse. Recover, let nothing go waste. Even if additional energy is exp expended, we should attempt to recover serviceable material and innovate to find new uses for, new uses for it. Replace, replace a high carbon footprint with a low one, and finally refuse, simply refuse to accept products and that are not environmental friendly. To my mind, it is the last R that is the most difficult and the most potent in affecting sustainable climate mitigation, as it has behind it the power of I, the consumer. Fifth and the last is the issue of ethics, morality and fair play. That the cause of environmental production and sustainable development is good, ethical, a common cause issue and opportune is easily understood and accepted. However, the ethics component operates when choices have to be made on inputs that impact outcomes. Should we produce products that are green through a process that is green and sell it to customers through a green vendor chain? The obvious answer is yes. However, when we add the input cost component to the mix, the dynamics changes rapidly. It is here the business, 
I'm sorry, as it stands today, most green technologies are relatively expensive and result in products that have a green cost added on. Discerning consumers who are willing to pay for this additive cost are shrinking in the, pre in the prevailing economically distressing times. Consumers' research studies have shown that in times of economic distress, and let us not call it recession, issues such as green and sustainability travel much lower in the consumer's pecking order of priorities. Even the concept of value diminishes and cost becomes the sole arbiter of product selection. It is here the business face a moral dilemma as the matter whittles down to a survive versus perish option. Clearly, moral and ethical leadership at this juncture is important and desirable, but it is difficult to realize. Perhaps policy frameworks such as those operating in the renewable energy space, thereby making them affordable to the ordinary consumers, will be required. In conclusion, the five points agenda covers much space from the hydrocarbon industry-specific interventions to personal and moral dilemma faced by managers and consumers today. However, much remains unsaid that will surely be covered by other learned speakers and panelists. I am once again grateful to, to the organizers for providing me this opportunity to connect with this distinguished audience, and thank you very much for giving me this patient hearing. Thank you.